So I, I remember back in the mid 1990s, there were lots of excitement. One was, of course, about um, proof of Fermat's last theorem, and the other was uh, about the cyber Witten equations. So today, uh, Sir Mike Matias is going to continue his talks on the geometry explores the nucleus with uh, the title uh, Cyber Witten equations. Uh, well, actually, I'm not. <laughs> um, I have to um, my lecture like yesterday, every lecture has to be prepared in advance, and then when you come to the audience, you have to decide whether it's the right lecture for the audience or not. And I think yesterday I decided that um, the lecture progress was a little bit too, too much material and a little bit too ambitious for the occasion. So I think I'm going to decide to slow down a bit. Um, and still the main focus is this topic I described before, and but I will not talk about zeinberg witten equations now because there's not time for everything. And I, if there's time later on, I can say. But also, I didn't. They don't. Not an essential part of what the program I wanted to talk about. They're important, but I won't have time to do everything. So I want to focus on the important things, which is the geometry and the topology. So I, I will leave. Sorry for the not telling you in advance, but uh, if anybody wants to know about zeinberg witten equations and I don't have time, come and see me privately. But uh, uh, they are very important. Uh, well, I should just say a comment. I mentioned early on that the revolution in geometry, which was produced by Simon Donaldson, uh, using ideas for physics, uh, and I want to use the results of things that are coming out of Donaldson's work. I would like to use them for physics. Uh, and the Zabbard Witten equations are essentially equivalent to Donaldson's work, and, so, and they're more directly connected with physics. So that's why they are important but only when we go further into the theory. I mean, how far, uh, I'll leave them aside. But let me get back to the main topic that I'm trying to describe. I'm trying to see whether it's possible to find models of protons and neutrons, which are called baryons, in terms of four-dimensional geometry. And I'll come back later to exactly what kind, but four-dimensional Riemannian manifolds. Uh, now, besides baryons, there are also things called leptons. They include the, basically the electron and the neutrino. The proton is positively charged, the electron is negatively charged, the neutron and the neutrinos have no charge, and they are also more complicated particles, but these are the basic par particles which are stable, which, which make up uh, matter. And so it, well, I started off with the aim of getting uh, geometrical models for baryons, but on the way it seemed also natural to think one can, whether one could do the same thing for leptons in parallel. So and I found that it was the same methods, ideas that were used for baryons, we were also going to work for leptons. So let me try and, that will be the aim to explain. Now I started off last time talking a little bit about um, solitons in general, and I mentioned that there were these uh, instantons, SU2 instantons and R4. S SU2 instantons, these are the things that did, Donaldson did use on general four manifolds to get very powerful information, and they are the solutions of some... Um, Nonlinear partial differential equations associated with different groups, and the, the solutions are given by what is so called the self dual Young Mills equations, uh, which you have to solve and on a compact manifold or manifold with suitable conditions and boundary. There are finite parameter space of solutions, and these are the moduli spaces of instantons, and there's a big theory. But what I was trying to explain last time was there is a relationship between these instantons, which are much studied on R4, and the skirmions which are the models for protons and neutrons introduced by SCIRM many years ago, which is a simpler model in three-dimensional space, where we start off by looking at maps of three-dimensional space into the group SU2, and these give rise to uh, with satisfying suitable energy, suitable differential equation, and these are then meaning the models for the baryons. But I showed, or roughly indicated, how you can go from a gauge field in four dimensions to something map into the group in three dimensions by doing what is called parallel transport along the fourth dimension. Parallel transport along the fourth dimension, from plus infinity to minus infinity, uh, depends on the point in three-dimensional space, and the end result is a point in the group. As you vary, move along all the four-dimensional space, you get function from R3 into the group, and that's the kind of thing that Skirm studied. So in this way, uh, you try to connect up the four-dimensional problem with the three-dimensional problem to get some insights. That was the idea. Uh, now, um, the things that come into the story are 
on two sides. There are uh, Riemannian geometry on one side, and Einstein uh, model of Riemannian geometry for gravitation. On the left-hand side, there are what are called gauge fields, which are connections, which are potentials, which are like these SU, coming from SU2 and other groups. These give rise to the different uh, f equations of f physics, the Maxwell equations, electromagnetism, comes just from ordinary U1 group, the abelian case. The more complicated non-abelian groups give rise to what are called the yang mills equations. And this is all of physics is basically uh, de developing the quantum theory of these equations. Um, then another idea which came in many years ago, which I will, t will want to use, was called the kaluza klein idea, uh, for originally coming from ideas of Hermann Weyl, which was uh, Hermann Weyl wanted to explain uh, electromagnetism in a geometrical way, like Einstein described gravitation. He found you could do that in terms of curvature and so on, and in modern language, or subsequently taken up, the idea was that if you ta imagine you take space-time, Minkowski space, but you can forget about time for the moment, and you imagine multiplying this by a circle, giving you a fifth, fifth dimension. Then, uh, if you think of putting a, Riemannian, a metri metric on the whole space, which is Riemannian in the spatial dimensions R3 and in the circle, but it's sort of Lorentzian in the direction of time, then this will get, then you write down the Einstein equation in five dimensional space, you will find the Einstein equation in four dimensional space together with Maxwell's equations. So if you incorporate Maxwell's equations uh, in a geometrical form by adding another, another dimension. The other dimension is thought to be some small circle, a very small size, so you don't notice it. And that was the Kaluza Klein idea. Then there is the Penrose approach to uh, geometry and with physical motivation in which um, so all, all the, very, the basic equations in mathematical physics, Maxwell, Yang Mills, uh, Dirac, Einstein, if you, these equations, if you divide them up into what are called the self-dual and which you can do in some sense, and then and only focus on half the equation, then you can solve these equations by a beautiful method developed by Penrose depending on his twister theory in terms of functions of three complex variables, of holomorphic theory. Very powerful theory, it's all, and I'll say more about that. So this is a very powerful tool, and I want to use that. Uh, one of the most beautiful things in mathematics in recent years was the Penrose theory, also the Donaldson theory, uh, and the Kluza Klein idea. I want to use all these ideas in some suitable way to help me find models for the barrier. Now, there are, I mentioned that there are problems of moduli spaces. If you have any, any of these problems, then the solution is not usually unique. There are parameters on which it depends. You get a manifold of parameters. This manifold usually has some special structure, special metric. These give you good examples of Riemannian manifolds, in particular of dimensions four. Uh, and then I mentioned I'm putting an arrow going backwards. I'm not quite sure why I put it going backwards, but and I would have the word spinners underneath. I'm not quite sure what I had in mind either. Uh, spinners are important, so let's leave it at that. Uh, well, no, I think I do mean more. In four dimensions, uh, the spinners are more interesting than in three dimensions. And so going, going backwards, uh, well, I'll say more about that later. And mm -hmm. so self-duality, I mentioned Penrose's theory. Self-duality will be a very important role, both in gauge field and in Romanian geometry. So these are the kind of ingredients that I want to use. Now, let me go back to, to, to topology. I mentioned a bit last time. I'll say it again. Suppose we take a four-dimensional manifold. In, uh, now, f f f f for the f all the time I'm going to be talking about potential physical applications, I'm going to be ignoring time. This is not going to be a relativistic theory. It's a theory about stable static objects. So time is irrelevant for the present. Eventually, you want to study it. And so we throw away the time variable. That leaves us with three spatial dimensions, but a fourth dimension from the kaluza klein idea so we want to look at four-dimensional Riemannian manifolds. Okay? The four-dimensional Riemannian manifolds, and the first thing is they should be oriented manifolds. It would be important to choose an orientation. Uh, and, some, and sometimes I will take manifolds to be compact, later not compact, and I'll, now we'll review the fundamental topological invariance of compact oriented manifolds. Of course, the homology is the most important part of the manifold. And the rank of the homology groups are called the Betty numbers, you have Betty numbers in dimensions 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, 4 is tr trivial, but there is duality, which tells you the Betty numbers in dimensions 1 and 3 are the same, 4 and 0 are the same, 2 is 
is, is dual to itself. Now, the Euler characteristic of any manifold, any space, is just the alternating sum of the Betty numbers. So it's, it's 1 minus B1 plus B2 minus B3 plus B4, but because B3 is the same as B1 and B4 is equal to E1, it's twice 1 minus B1 plus B2. Now, in the, B, in the second homology, we have a very interesting fact. In the second homology, we have an intersection matrix or in terms of differential form is given by multiplying two forms and integrating. This is symmetric. Unlike in dimension 2, where the middle dimension is, is 1, and there you get a skew-symmetric matrix. Now, skew-symmetric matrices have no interesting invariance except their rank. Symmetric matrices have a signature. You put a diagonal form, some plus signs, some minus signs. And so the, set, the middle dimension, B, B2, breaks up into two parts. You call B2 plus the number of positives, number B2 minus the number of negatives, and this is an important part of the topology. And the signature is defined as the difference between B2 plus and B2 minus, and it was actually Hermann Weyl who first drew attention to the topological fact that there was an interesting invariant in four dimensions, which is not no counterpart in dimensions three or two. Uh, and so there are two invariants in dimension 4, topological, the, the Euler characteristic, and the signature. Uh, of course, there are more invariants than Betty numbers, but there's a difference. The Euler characteristic and signature are the only ones of these invariants that can be obtained by integration of some expression in terms of the curvature. You have a curvature from a manifold, and you can from this construct various particular integrands, and if you integrate them, sometimes you will get a topological invariant, which is by definition constructed locally. And the signature and the Euler characteristic are both of this type. Now, the difference between an invariant which is computed locally and one which is cannot is easily, easily seen if you imagine forming a finite covering of a manifold. Then an invariant which can be calculated locally, it will be simply multiplied by the degree of the covering. If you take a metric below and lift it above, locally you get so many copies. So Euler characteristic and signature have this property. But the Betty numbers, for example, do not. The Betty numbers don't just... It's more complicated than just multiplying by the number of sheets. So the Betty numbers are not local, but the signature and oil characteristic are. Now, another important thing is, the well, first of all, the trivial one, that the oil characteristic and the signature have the same parity. You can see that at once from that formula up there because, well, it's a trivial observation. Um, the second more tri interesting observation is that the signature changes sign under reversal of orientation because the quadratic form which defines intersection, depends on the orientation of the four-manifold. If you look and see how you define signs, when you change the orientation of the whole space, then you change the signs. So plus becomes minus, minus becomes plus. So the signature reverses. The Euler characteristic is not. So these two important invariants. Now, both the Euler characteristic and the signature have a very another important property in geometry. They are both indices of elliptic differential operators. Index of a differential operator on a manifold is the dimension of the null space minus the dimension of the null space of the adjoint. And this is very stable under perturbation, doesn't change, and it can give me by topological formulas quite generally, and both of these are examples. And the examples of the differential operators are very simple. They are both constructed from the differential operator of the exterior derivative on differential forms and its adjoint, d star. If you take the sum of those two operators acting on the sum of all forms of all degrees, that is an elliptic differential operator. But more interestingly is you decompose all the differential forms into two parts and look at the operator going from one part to the other part. And there are two different decompositions which are relevant. One is decompose them according to the degree of the form, the parity, even and odd. Obviously, D and D star both change the parity. They go from the even forms to the odd forms. But also you can look at the, the differential forms which are invariant under the duality operator star which is defined by the Riemannian metric, which just basically once you have differential forms, you have a metric, you replace something depending on some variables by the orthogonal variables. And the star, uh, it mixes up, it interchanges the zero forms and the four forms, the one forms and the three forms. So, uh, some, but in the middle, it acts on the same space and decomposes into two parts. They are the self-dual and anti-self-dual. And when you look at the harmonic forms, the solutions of this, operator, they just give you the Betty numbers, B2 plus and B2 minus. So it's not, e not easy to see that if you decompose the, all the forms according to the eigenvalues of the star operator, then again, this D plus D star interchanges the two, 
And if you go from the plus space to the minus space, his index will be the signature. So the signature and the Euler characteristic are both occur in a very similar way, but one of them depends on the parity, and the other depends on the, on the duality operator. Of course, the parity is more, more general. The, students, the other one depends on having an orientation and management and so on. But so that bec and because the general theorem says any index, any elliptic operator can be calculated by some integral, then these show you that they can be calculated by an integral. So those are the most fundamental invariants of, of, of a manifold which we have to use. Now, because of the uh, observation about the parity, Euler characteristic of signature, it's in fact true that you can make a refinement of the Euler characteristic of signature if you consider the Euler characteristic plus the signature divided by 2 or minus the signature divided by 2. This will also be an integer because they have the same parity. And these are really more refined. Uh, and they, in fact, can be, each of them can be expressed as the index of half the all the drum class. You take just the differential forms going from 0 to 1 into 2, but then you stop and project onto half the space. You get it to half the drum complex. If you make it into an operator, you will go from 0 forms, the next sum with self dual 2 forms, into 1 forms. That itself is an elliptic operator. Its index is, depending on which signs I've got, Euler characteristic plus signature over 2. If you project on omega 2 minus, you'll get the same thing with the minus. So these these uh, refined versions are, in fact, indices in their own right, and this is important if you want to worry about things, you know, whether they're multiples of two or multiples of a half. So that's quite important. Uh, I haven't talked about zyberg witten theory, but these do occur in zyberg witten theory. Uh, anyone gets on to it. Now, a physical interpretation. Um, the idea is that these, uh, the two integers we have, the two topological invariants, should in somehow be related to the two topological fundamental integer quantities that occur in physics. There's the baryon number and the electric charge. So we know that both baryon number and electric charge are integral quantities. The integer are multiples of a fixed unit. It's a very fundamental fact about both of them. I mean, and they're very stable. This is a sort of, you know, the, one of the most important facts of physics that you can learn is that the baryon number, as far as we know, is conserved, is stable, and so on. And electric charge is integral multiples. These are very important facts of physics. And so if you can relate them to the topological invariants, we will have made a fundamental first step in getting geometrical models for physics. So uh, now, because when we reverse orientation, something happens, the signature changes sign, we should worry about what happens when you change orientation. So the first proposal, these are all proposals of models. I only got a, I'm a salesman. I'm trying to sell something. You, know, <laughs> you go to the physicist and they say, I want to buy uh, a proton. Well, I say, here is my, my model. Um, and so the first observation is, if you reverse the orientation, what should you do? Well, you should get the antiparticle. Physics made out of baryons and protons, but they're also antimatter. Antimatter is made out of, and every particle is an antiparticle. Again, the universal law of physics. Whatever particle you've got, you put anti in front, and there's another particle. It may be difficult to find it. There's not much antimatter in this room, fortunately, because if matter and antimatter collide, there's a big bang. Uh, but uh, the, the, I mean, for example, the electron, the anti-electron is called the positron. The positron was discovered experimentally, and nowadays you probably know about it. Uh, PET scanning, the positron, electron, I mean, the, 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 they are used. They can be constructed. So positrons exist, antiparticles. Uh, antimatter is harder to get. So you can make it in the high accelerators. So physics uses, anti the theory at least, has to allow for antiparticles. And so... Math mathematical model that depends on oriented manifold, and there's only one choice, reverse orientation. What else can you do? So every manifold, whatever it is, you can reverse the orientation. Okay? So you cut the problem in half. Only think about half the manifolds. Um, secondly, let's look at topology change. Um, if you have any manifold, uh, then two manifolds, you can sometimes you can think of gluing them together. You cut a little hole in one, a little hole in the other, you put a little tube pipe, and you glue them and make a bit more complicated manifold. Or you can think of the process the other way around. Take a manifold, and cut it in half, along something, and then glue, fill in the halves and separate them. So uh, in physics language, this will be called fusion and fission. Fusion is when you bring them together. Fission is when you bring them apart. Don't mention the words, you know, when anybody is listening, because they might think you're a nuclear terrorist. But uh, <laughs> uh, This is topological terrorism. <laughs> okay, now... the. Important fact is that uh, 
but the oil catalytic and signature, uh, they're both essentially additive. If you take two manifolds and you do this operation of gluing them together, you can easily prove that the, oil, the signature is the sum of the two signatures. The oil catalytic is nearly the same, not quite, because when you glue them together, you cut out something and you, they'll, they'll be the add, add up except for a little constant. Uh, now, you think of the corresponding thing in, in the case of surfaces. If you have surfaces, Riemann surfaces, when you take, for example, a curve of genus 2, you can think of it as two holes and you cut it in half, you get it by gluing two curves of genus 1, two tori. And any, any Riemann surface, genus G, is obtained by forming this, what they call, connected sum of G copies of the elliptic curve, genus 1. So the number which adds up correctly is the genus. But the oil characteristic of Riemann surface is not the genus. It's, it's 2 minus 2 G is the formula of the oil characteristic. There's a little factor of 2, but that's just because it's to do with the, when you cut, you remove a point in a sphere. So it's a rather trivial difference. So it, this will be just the same. The, si- the signature is even better because it, it uh, if you like, when you make a connected sum, you should really make a correction by adding the oil characteristic of the, of, the, of the intersection. But the signature will vanish for that piece, so it doesn't, doesn't matter. So, uh, topology changes is, is, is very is a way which you can think of manifolds gl- gluing together and pulling apart. And if you want to make models of hadrons in physics, they should also be possible to put them together and come apart. We know that in the physical world, you, a, a nucleus can split, split in half. We know very well. So, uh, being able to join together and uh, split apart, and of course, baryon number uh, and charge are things which are, you know, would be preserved in a system. If you have a system made of two things, the number of baryons will be some of the baryons in the pieces, charge should be additive. So you want things which are integral and additive when you connect them up. So these are fundamental kind of qualitative features which we must use for our models. Now I go to something more, more serious. Just like with Riemann surfaces, the first thing you can do about the Riemann surface is you look at the topology, the number of holes, homology, all the characteristic. But the next thing you do if you think about complex variables and make complex structure on a Riemann surface, a Riemann surface means a surface with a complex parameter. And there's a very beautiful theory, of course, of Riemann surfaces with complex variables, which essentially are algebraic curves, long history, all large parts of 19th century mathematics, from Arbel to Riemann, was concerned with studying complex Riemann surfaces. So we want to do something similar with four dimensions. Now, in four dimensions, the situation is more complicated so we have to try and find the best solution we have. Now, here is my proposal. Now, in, in four dimensions, um, we can look at, first of all, a conformal structure. Now, in complex variable, in two dimensions, a conformal structure is the same thing as a complex structure. Conformal structure means you have a metric which you can change up to a scale factor that varies from point to point. The angles are preserved, but the scale distances are changed. So in two dimensions, conformal means complex. In four dimensions, it is not. It's not the same. But we can certainly look at conformal f- geometry first. Secondly, we have this notion of a metri- metrics or, or conformal structure being self-dual or, or not. Or, or not. Or, or, I'm sorry. In general, they will be neither one nor the other, but a special class of manifolds or special class of conformal structures would be those which are self-dual. And this is the class I would like to focus on. They are the, defined in terms of the, the Romanian geometry um, I haven't got it here, but I'll come to it later on. Um, in terms of the vanishing of a certain quantity called the, the, the vial tensor, if you have a Riemannian metric, you have a complicated thing called the Riemann curvature. The Riemann curvature can be broken up into several pieces, one of which is the Ricci tensor. The Ricci tensor itself has within it a scalar curvature part. The other side, outside the Ricci tensor, there is what is called the vial tensor. The vial tensor is the part that is unchanged under conformal variation. The Ricci tensor changes. So for a conformal structure, you have a vial tensor. That's true in any dimension. In dimension 4, something special happens. The vial tensor itself breaks up into two parts, the positive self-dual and the anti-self-dual. Very beautiful fact in four dimensions is you have that. And now you can require that one half of that vanishes. If the negative part vanishes, then you say the manifold is self-dual. It only has the positive part of the vial curve. It, it, the difference between these two is very much like the difference between holomorphic and anti-holomorphic. So you see, we're trying to get something like complex structure. So look, if we look at the manifolds, conformal structures, 
which is L-dual, this is a class of four manifolds, and this manifold, this class is quite extensive. It's, you don't want to have a model of, of manifolds which are so rigid that there aren't any examples around. You don't want a model which so, and includes all manifolds, you know, without restriction. They want a, you want a suitable class that should be um, interesting to study. And so I'm proposing that conformally self-dual four manifolds is the right class. Now, by coincidence or otherwise, this is exactly the class of manifolds which Penrose's twisted theory applies. These are precisely the manifolds which have twisted spaces. And the twisted space means you, you get, the twisted space is a complex three-dimensional manifold, six real variables, and you can convert the four-dimensional geometry of a, four, of a conformally self-dual manifold into the complex analysis of the twisted space. So then you are enabled to do almost like you can in Riemann surface theory, apply complex variable theory in a beautiful way, and a lot of machinery, and so there's a magnificent machine. Now, the Twitter space is actually is a brilliant idea. Uh, and let me just summarize some of the key facts. If you start off, the, 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 the Twitter space, of, if, if your manifold X is a four-dimensional Riemannian manifold, then you can construct over this a six-dimensional manifold whose fibers are two spheres, actually complex predictive lines, the total space is actually a complex three-dimensional manifold. The fibers are actually complex analytic sub-manifolds, and they, are, they move in a family parameterized by the points of the base space. Which, and, that's, and you construct them from the base space by a standard procedure if you have a conformally self-dual manifold. And then the, the exam, standard example is if you take the fourth sphere, which is conformally flat, just the conformal structure of the round sphere, then over this, the standard, the twisted space is the complex predictive three space. In the complex predictive three space, uh, you get this picture. If you, in the complex predictive three space, you can have a complex conjugation, which gives you what's called a real structure. And the usual one is you just take complex conjugation of all the coordinates. Then there are real points given by the, the real predictive space. But there's another complex conjugation which is different. And this other complex conjugation comes by using the quaternions. I've given it down the bottom, down there. If you use the, the, the quaternions, which, which, which is a copy of C2, so C4 is a copy of two copies of the quaternions, and you use the operation of multiplication by the quaternion J, the quaternions of I, J, and K, if you think the complex structure is given by I, multiplied by J is anti-holomorphic, because it anti-commutes with I, J squared is minus 1, but that's the identity on pretty space, and this gives you a real structure, different from the usual real structure, and in this real structure, it has, the property is there are no real points. There are no point fixed. By, you have an anti-involution on the space, uh, but it has no fixed points. So this is a model of a manifold which is with a complex involution, anti-linear, with no, real, no fixed points, no real points. But it has real lines. If you take any point, then it's, com it's, it's common it's conjugate, in this sense, is another point. And two points can be joined by a unique line, and because it's an involution, you can see this line has to be fixed by the structure. So this is a real line in that sense. And therefore, the, the parameter of this real line is at some real variable, and the real variable is precisely the point in the fourth sphere. In fact, the, all the complex lines, all the lines in complex effective C space are well known to be parameterized by four-dimensional complex quadric. And this one is the real point of that quadric for this particular real structure. So this, this is a very simple example. And now the beautiful part of the theory um, is developed by Penrose, is that, well, I think I should maybe come to the next page. No, I haven't. Is that um, the kind of equations you want to so satisfy and solve in four-dimensional space uh, are, in fact, well, first of all, the, most of these equations are, conform ones are conformally invariant. They don't need a metric. And secondly, you, if you lift these equations up to complex perspective space, they have a purely holomorphic interpretation, and you can solve them by holomorphic methods, and then get the answer down below. If you have also using the real involution uh, to get you sort of real structures, and this applies to the Maxwell's equations, the Dirac equation, the Yang-Mills equations, and the Einstein equations. All of them in the self-dual context. You'll solve the self-dual Maxwell equation, self-dual Einstein equations, self-dual Yang-Mills equations. Um, even though the Yang-Mills equations and Einstein equations are very, very non-linear. The theory still works. It's a very beautiful theory. So, exceptionally powerful piece of geometry mathematics, which in this class of manifolds is exactly what you need to get a very powerful 
that is analytical tool. So we have now a model of manifolds which has a lot of good features. You have techniques, understand it, use it. It's very much like complex uh, variable theory, like Riemann surfaces. And like Riemann surfaces, I'll get to it somewhere. Um, no, I'll come back to that. I'll leave that. I'll tell you more about it later. I think I've gone ahead of myself a bit. But let me um, digress a moment. Um, I said at the beginning that I was going to deal with compact manifolds, but I also want to use some non-compact manifolds. Just like with Riemann surface theory, you may want to take a Riemann surface and, for example, puncture it at the point. And then you get non-compact Riemann surface. It's a very important part of the theory. And in fact, if you want to um, take a connected sum of two Riemann surfaces, you can think of it as trying to pull them apart along a tube that you stretch away. And similarly is true here. I want to consider a manifold that's not um, necessarily compact, but when I put a metric on them, I want them to be complete. You know, the metric should be such that when you go to the boundary, you take infinite length of time, infinite length to get there. So it will be important to have, and there are formulae for the Euler characteristic and the signature uh, for manifolds of this kind. Uh, in general, there is some contribution from the asymptotic boundary that what's happening out here makes a correction term to the ordinary formulas, but in principle, we, we have good control over the Euler characteristic and the signature, which are coming from index theory, which me means that even if the manifold is not compact, we can say something about these numbers. Now here I've written, I was obviously jumped ahead of myself, here is the conf what I told you about the conformal structure. The vial tensor breaks up into two parts. Now the formula I told you that was said that the signature was given by integral formula can be written like this. The, the uh, vial tensor has an actual L2 norm. In the middle dimension, the norm squared doesn't depend on the metric because you take a two-form times the star of the two-form two and integrate a four-form. No, no metric is required, only the star operator, which in middle dimensions is conformally invariant. So the, the norm squared of W is conformally invariant. Well, I told you W itself was conformally invariant. And if you take the difference between w, the norm squared of W plus and the norm squared of W minus up to a factor of two, 12 pi squared, this is the signature formula. And these are, this L2 norm squared is an integral expression. You take the curvature, you form some algebraic combination, you integrate. There is your integral formula written in a compact form. And now clearly you see that if the W minus is zero, then immediately this tells you that the signature is greater than or equal to zero. So for a self-dual manifold, the first observation is the signature is greater than or equal to zero. Now, if this four-dimensional manifold is... Uh, that's written down there, is meant to be a model for uh, a baryon, then it has a baryon number, and the baryon number is not negative. It tells you how many baryons there are. There can be no baryons, one baryon, two baryons, but no, there are no, you can't be missing. So it's important that your invariant, which tells to tell you how many baryons there are, should be positive. And here, the thing is positive, exactly for the class of manifolds we pick. So you can think of it as uh, other way around. If you want to choose a good formula, Good class of manifolds, this suggests a possibility. But by the way, when you reverse the orientation, a self dual manifold automatically becomes an anti self dual manifold. So when you reverse the orientation, the signature will change sign because now you're counting anti baryons. That's, that's okay. That, that fits in with the notion of changing from a particle to an antiparticle. So, uh, so far, it, it, this looks like we've made, by the way, I'm, I'm giving you the outcome. Of at least one or two years of struggle, trying different models of math, what is this, what is the right, and you know, making mistakes and getting contradictions and so on. So after clearing it all out, I think I've got now a model that is reasonably convincing. And that telling you it's just simply like this, but it took a lot of hard work to get to this point because there are many choices you can make. But still, it's encouraging. Now, the twister theory, as I mentioned, this is summarizing what I said before, enabled you to solve all these beautiful equations by, uh, I mean, when you go to three complex variables, you, you not only have a beautiful theory, but it's much more sophisticated than the theory of one complex variable. You have to deal with higher chief cohomology groups, all the modern complex analysis, but it's a very powerful theory. We have a lot of information in complex geometry. So this is, uh, we, we, we can't deal with it. Um, and now the point about connected sums, if you have Riemann surfaces, you can glue them together, you know that, uh, and you can make complex structures behave like that. And the answer is that 
if you take these self-dual manifolds, it's also true that you can glue them together. This is proved by Donaldson uh, using, in fact, twister theory, because you convert the self-dual manifold into a twister space. You glue the twister space by some complex, or you deform the twister space by complex analysis, then you reinterpret it back into self-dual manifolds. Self-dual manifolds can be def- broken up in this way, but sometimes they're in an obstruction. Uh, because you're in higher dimension, the theory is more subtle. And this obstruction, if it vanishes, you can make it. If you can't vanish, you can't make it. That's why four dimensions is more subtle. And that Donaldson theory, uh, or Zabit Whitson theory, reflects that. The fact that the four dimensions has these very much more interesting features, which Donaldson theory discovered, is closely related to the fact that you can't always decompose. You can't always break things in half. I told you that an algebraic surface, by Donaldson theorem, essentially cannot be decomposed in an interesting way. So it's very far from being the case that you can decompose everything. Decomposition is possible, but there are strong restrictions. And this is a model for the corresponding things in physics. That should correspond to what really happens. So there's a lot of tests potentially there uh, to create these obstructions to the things that would happen in, in physics. So that's still, un- I mean, this has not been done. All I'm telling you is that here is a, is a class of models which has within it a very a subtle process which can be of fission or fusion, which is re- related to Donaldson theory and which will presumably have very deep consequences. And if it's, if it's the right model of physics, it should relate to deep things in physics. So it's, a, it's an offering which would not be available if you had a much simpler model. So here, as I've told about the latest sum. So this is, I'm just putting down on, on here now what I've been talking about all the time, my provisional idea, okay, after all this, is that a baryon is modeled by a self-dual four-dimensional manifold X, okay, and that the baryon number is the signature of X. And the manifold may be compact or non-compact at the moment, we haven't quite specified. So that's the first uh, invariant, the signature, as the baryon number, and we have a candidate. It won't, it won't be the answer, we'll modify it, prove it, but the first Step. Now, if we go to the back to the um, Kaluza Klein idea of, of, of pictures of manifold, in the Kaluza Klein idea, you have this fifth dimension, the space time. But if you forget about time, we're really going to be dealing with four dimensions. So, a four dimensional manifold, and the idea is the four dimensional manifold should be fibered over, over three dimensional space by a circle. That's the extra circle. But it's important this vibration should be thought of as only asymptotic, not necessarily everywhere, only sort of at the end where you're looking at. Now, what exactly that means, I'll try to explain later. Uh, so don't require the manifold to be actually fibered by a circle, but only require it asymptotically. In other words, if it's not compact, it should be fibered by a circle at its, towards its end. Uh, now, <clears throat> uh, here is the first example, uh, and now we want to see how this is related to electric charge. Now, um, I should say that the model I'm going to talk about will be one in which is very familiar to physics, but I've replaced electric charge by magnetic charge. I've interchanged their roles. It's well known that electricity and magnetism, in some sense, are dual, and I'm going to use that duality to use the electric model rather than the magnetic model. And this is convenient because the, the magnetic model, what's called the, the Dirac monopole, I think I mentioned, may have mentioned it before, has been known a long time. I'm now going to relabel that and call it the electron. Because the point, isolated point of magnetic strength is a fiction. It doesn't actually exist. But an isolated point of electric charge does exist. It's called the electron. So, you know, the electron is the most, is the most obvious model to have in this game. It corresponds to the, what, the manifold which is used in this game. Now, that manifold which is used comes this way. Let's start with the most important bit of topology. We, we, I mentioned already the Hopf vibration. Uh, so if you start off with C2 acted on by the complex numbers of absolute value 1. Um, then, if you uh, go away from the origin, then uh, what you get is the predictive lines, is the two-sphere. Um, <coughs> and so we want, the ma- we want the manifold, we look at them totally <coughs> like that. So you have a manifold which, away from the source of the charge, it looks like uh, lengths going off infinity. Times of uh, hot vibration over the two-sphere below. The two-sphere will be in three-dimensional space, will be what you will see. 
Look, if you're outside in three-dimensional space, you will see the outside of this particle. The particle is the electron. Uh, you don't see inside very carefully, but you see the outside. And, and this, this, the, the, what you have inside is what you call the singularity, uh, the, where the electric charge sits. Except it's not really a singularity. In the case of the, the manifold we want, it's a point in four-dimensional space, but it's a point, actually, in these models, where the circle has shrunk to a point. So the manifold above is actually acted on by the circle, but the manifold is, in fact, C2. As you get to the origin, the circle has shrunk to a point. So C2, with the action of a circle S1, is, in some sense, the model of the electron. Not quite, but very, very close. It gives us the right topology. And the fact that the first churn class of the bundle on the boundary is 1, the Hopf vibration, will explain why the electric charge of the electron is 1. This is basically Dirac's argument inverted. If you're outside the two-sphere, the amount of flux that comes through is unit flux because the topology of the Chern class tells you that. This is the argument originally used for mono, with the monopole interpretation, but we can change the interpretation to make it... The, so the electron basically is going to be just that basic picture of C2 with a circle action. Now, I've mentioned already that we have this electric magnetic duality, and I've used, I've changed the picture so that what was called before a, a monopole is now called an electron. Uh, it seems better. Now, or a positron. That depends on the orientation you give to C2. C2 has its natural orientation of a complex structure, but it has also the opposite. And it's a matter of convention, which one you want to choose. And it's a bit confusing to keep these things straight. So let's just say one choice gives you the electron, and one choice gives you the, the, the positron. Now, notice that the uh, C2 has no topology. There's no homology groups. Signature is zero. But that's fine because signature counts the baryon number and the electron is not a baryon, it's a lepton. There are no... I mean, lep, the, the electron belongs to a different family from the, from the, from the baryons. The baryons uh, have sort of the large... The protons are the large heavy things of matter. Electrons are the small light things. They have electric charge, but they don't sort of carry weight in that sense. So they're very different. And the difference is there's no topology. There's no, no Betty number at all. So it's ideal. This is, fine. this is very good. I said good, exclamation mark. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you move on from there, so that, that tells you what charge should look like. The charge should look like, coming from the Hopf bundle over the sphere, it should look like the electron. So for the proton, we want something that is now mixed. It wants to, we want to have a non-compact manifold so we see the electric flux coming out, just like with the electron, except we want the opposite sign. That's the question of orientation. We want a self-dual four manifold, but now we want signature one because baryon number is 1. And we want the behavior uh, to be like a positron at infinity. In other words, we want to behave like the electron with opposite orientation. And it should have a circle action at infinity, just like the electron has. So what candidates can you find? Well, here, here's, here's what... Fir first natural candidate might be think of just take the complex vector plane and remove a point. And then sort of stretch it out. Uh, near that point, it looks like C2, or perhaps C2 without... And that will look like uh, uh, what we want, and certainly the standard metric on C2 is self-dual and the right orientation, it could be a candidate. But there's another candidate, which I prefer, for a reason, and that's the one down below, uh, here. This is the metric I mentioned before, which is actually a metric on the complement in C2. You remove not a point in CP2, but you move, you move the real predictive plane. Okay? It's an open set in CP2, and on this one, we have this beautiful metric which came from the theory of magnetic monopoles, which I call the mono, non abelian monopoles of charge 2 and centered, that's the zero in the center, which is a four-dimensional manifold, which is not only a self-dual, but actually not only a conformal, actually is an Einstein manifold, it has metric, which is actually an Einstein manifold with scale, scalar curvature zero, and is complete, and is unique, and is SO3 invariant, and is the only one. So this is a beautiful ma manifold. I say it, although it's one as well. I discovered with Nigel Hitchin. I mean, I, I apologize for the fact that it's usually called the AH manifold. But it, it's a beautiful manifold because it's absolutely unique. Um, it, it has no parameters. It's, it's only one there is up to overall scale. Um, and it, it's interesting because it, when people first try to find solutions of the Einstein equations, self-dual, which were invariant under rotation, they missed it. Hawking and Gibbons wrote down a paper, and they said that they didn't find it. They found other ones. And this one is much subtler. 
and has a lot of very subtle features. And one of the reasons they missed it, very simple in a way, if you want to write out a metric, you write it usually in form of you know, dx squared plus dy squared dz with some coefficients, which may be variable functions of other variable. And they call them a, b, and c. Or, uh, well, they were, they were positive, so they call them a squared, b squared, and c squared to make sure they're positive. But then they assumed that a, b, and c were positive. And then you get only, you don't, this solution doesn't exist. This solution, or at least one of these a, b, and c has to be negative. The square is positive, but A is, when you write down the equation, they involve the first order parts. And then that very subtle solution exists and has very remarkable properties. So it's a beautiful manifold, uh, and I want to choose that as the kind of prototype. It won't be the final story, but it will be the prototype for the proton. So, double-edged. so this is my candidate, first candidate for the proton. It's this particular manifold in the topology of CP2 minus RP2. Now, um, I'm going to, this lecture and the next lecture are going to sort of run into each other. Where I stop here, where I start next time is a matter of choice. But, so at this stage, I've got to the point where I've told you the models I want, I've told you what their topology should be, I've told you what the topological invariants are, how they should be related to the physical quantities of charge and barrier number. I've told you the reversal of orientation gives you antiparticles. I've indicated... Uh, then I've gone on beyond that to the self-dual conformal structures, which are very rich uh, and which have properties very much like Riemann surfaces. In particular, you can glue things, pull them apart. Uh, and we have nice examples. And the, uh, the examples, we, we will find the electron. I'll, I'll get more precise about the electron later. And we found the proton. And I want to find more. And then we want to go on and do more things. So, but before that... General, general observation. We should talk about metrics. See, a conformal structure doesn't give you a metric. It gives you lots of information. Very detailed quality of information, but it doesn't give you a metric. Now, metrics in physics are important because metrics give you measurement. Every physical quantity is measured. Some length, some time. You look at it on your experiments. So measurement is absolutely vital. And there are different scales of measurement. Large energy, low energy. So physics has to have scales. But the scale is how the last part you should put in. You should have your model with everything ready, and then, then you, you put in the scale. So the conformal structure should come first. The topology comes first. The scale is the very last thing you've got to look at. <coughs> now, uh, there are several ways you can get to these metrics. And um, one way, which is in some sense a very natural way, is to use the standard procedure for finding metrics of constant scalar curvature. You probably know the, the Einstein equations come from what's called the Einstein-Hilbert action. You take the integral of the scalar curvature as a quantity. You, minimize, you try to minimize that. You look at the Euler-Lagrange equations. You get the Einstein. And the, the, the flow that tries to push a manifold towards a manifold of scalar curvature is called the Ricci flow, given by the, the Ricci tensor. Now, this is a very difficult differential equation to solve. Uh, in dimension two, it it leads you to the unique metric of constant scale, or the unique the metric of constant scalar curvature within a given conformal class, which is essentially unique. Um, but it's a very difficult so equation. And three dimensions, solving this was what Perelman did. Started off by Hamilton, Perelman showed that you could follow the Ricci flow and get to the metrics, well, not one metric of constant, you've got a complicated story with lots of pieces glued together. Whole th the Poincare conjecture is when it's on a sphere. But more generally, you have the whole Thurston story by decomposing manifolds in dimension three into bits with different kinds of curvature. So it's a very deep theory. I was recently in Paris when they gave Perelman his million dollars, except he didn't turn up. <laughs> <laughs> I would say I pocketed his money. But, uh, um, but on the other hand, here we've got a much simpler problem. Because now we, we're going to fix a conformal class. We've got a, we start off with a conformal class. We only want to find a metric in that conformal class all you need to do is to multiply by a function and write down the differential equation that says that the scalar curvature is constant. Now that is called the Yamabe problem. It was introduced a long time ago by Yamabe, uh, and it turned out that uh, he claimed to solve it, and show there was a solution. It, uh, it turned out there were lots of mistakes. The equation was still difficult, but finally after 20 years of work by many people, it has been solved. The Yamabe problem has always got a solution. You can always go until you get a metric of constant scalar curvature, which is, if you like, the preferred metric in that conformal class. So there is 
very much like the theory of Riemann surfaces, a preferred metric. Now, the solution always exists. It's not always unique. Not always that. There may be, may be parameters, moduli. But um, it get, what, what is important is that when you get this manifold, it has constant scalar curvature. And the scalar curvature has three possibilities. It can be positive, zero, or negative, just like in the case of Riemann surfaces. Uh, in the, if the scalar curvature is zero, and your manifold is already self-dual conformal manifold, then with that metric, it, you get what's called a hyperkähler ma manifold. A hyperkähler manifold is a beautiful manifold which is sorry, closely related to the quaternions. Its holonomy is inside SU2. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, uh, the, 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 in four dimensions, the holonomy group in general is a four-dimensional rotation group. But the four-dimensional rotation group breaks up, essentially, into two copies of SU2, left and right. And if one half of these vanishes, then the holonomy lies entirely in the other half. These are the hyperkähler manifolds. They have the property that their tangent space is naturally a vector space over the quaternions, and the quaternion operators are covariant constant as you move around. So it's a very rigid... Now, they're quite rare, but not as rare, as you, fortunately, as you might think. If you want the manifold to be compact, they're extremely rare. For a compact manifold, you only have the torus and the covering, uh, and the one exception, the famous K3 surface, the cortic, general cortic surface, with the famous kalabi yau metric. Otherwise, they don't exist. No, no, but they're 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 they're, 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 they're compact. No, there aren't even more compact ones. Not not hyperkähler manifolds. But it also it's usually another case. It's usually another Calabio. I, I, I think I'm right. Um, I'm not an expert, but I think I'm right. Um, <laughs> Uh, but the point is that you don't need, we don't need, we're not, in fact, only one thing compact manifold. In fact, we want the non-compact examples. If you want non-compact examples, when are complete, then there are many. In fact, they come out of physics. In fact, I told you one already. My model of a proton is a non-compact example. So non-compact hyperkähler manifolds are actually, do exist in quite large numbers. And so now, so now we're ready for, to look at our examples. Our fa basic examples we want four manifolds, okay? These will be, uh, will, they will not be the final version, they will be the prototypes. I'll explain what I mean by the prototypes. But there are four manifolds, and they come in two lots, two by two, so square. Uh, these ones here are compact. Um, these ones here are non-compact. Um, these ones here are mo models of... Um, show you around. Uh, sorry. These are, these are, these are compact... These are non-compact. Uh, these are going to be models of, of uh, baryons. These are models of leptons. Okay? So we have two classes of manifolds for the baryons and the leptons. The ones are blue and the ones are green. And within, within those, we have two kinds, those which are compact, those which are non-compact. The non-compact ones have electric charge, and the compact ones have no electric charge. If you think about it, the electric charge is what comes out of the manifold. If the manifold is compact, it's got no charge. No, it, you can't have charge. To lose. It's like having a function with no poles or a Riemann surface. So the compact ones have to be models of, this is to be the model of the neutron. This is the model of the proton. This is the model of the electron. This has to be the model of the neutrino. Because the neutrino is so the, the neutral form of the electron. You compactify this to get this. You compactify this to get this. So they're very, they're very parallel. This one has interesting homology. It has signatures, interesting signature one. Uh, this is signature one, the barium number one is in both cases. These ones have no homology, because they're, they're, they're leptons. So, I mean, this stage I sort of bow, and then uh, large applause, I get my Nobel Prize. And all. So, it, but the, the, if, you, if you look at, if you're naive at uh, this level, I don't think you can ask for the better models in terms of these models, these spaces. I'll, I, I mentioned already some of the geometry of these spaces, why they come exactly. This RP2 is a rather subtle one, but this manifold is sort of subtle. Um, they're really fund very, very fundamental spaces, and I'll show later on, they all come out of one point of view, in a way. There's a unique sort of starting point. Uh, and they just differ in the... They have to differ in certain ways, because one wants to be compact, the other wants to be non-compact to give you electric charge. One of them should have homology, and the other should not have homology to give you baryon number. And you couldn't get asked for anything simpler than that. 
So, the claim is, these are my candidates, or these are prototype candidates. Now, obviously, from the nature of them, you can see that whatever these manifolds have very large symmetry groups. They're big symmetry groups, uh, which is sometimes good, and sometimes too good. You know? uh, but they have very, obviously, they have large symmetry groups, and in physical systems, you very often want to have big symmetry groups. Later on, at some stage, you may want to break the symmetry. You've heard a lot about broken symmetry in physics. The famous Higgs field is something that breaks the symmetry. Um, and breaking the symmetry quite often is required to produce variation. So the prototype will be kind of the father figure with maximal symmetry. And then later on, you will want to do something, to break symmetry, do something else. So this, this is the first step. It's a prototype with these other things before we embark on any symmetry breaking and, 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 or anything like that. Now, this, my next slide really just says that, but let me just put it up for you. So this prototype are the models for the neutrino, the electron, the neutron, the proton, um, and what I said about charge. Um, now, and this is what I said about the uh, symmetry breaking. Um, what have I said here? Oh, yes. Now, uh, um, so I think I'll stop at this point because it's a good stop place to stop logically and also from time-wise, um, after the next stage will be to say, we want to deform these, these prototypes by some parameters to give models which break some symmetry and are more physically realistic and you know, have a good contact with reality. These are the father figures um, which everything starts. And there, in fact, will be two parameters. Uh, one parameter will do one kind of deformation, so one parameter deformations. And both parameters will actually can be thought of as coming by a sort of suitable process of um, by a certain U1 symmetry, which produces a moment map, as one does in symmetrical mechanics. And that parameter, the value of the moment map, will be the parameter which you want to vary. The different choices of different meanings geometrically. And because they come from U1 moment maps, these parameters, real, they are real numbers, but the integer points on them have some special meaning. And sometimes they're quantized. And I think that may have some physical meaning as well. So I will describe next time, tomorrow, what these two parameters are, what they do geometrically, and what they might correspond to physically. Uh, I've got some guesses, suggestions. I mean, all of this is, you know, you produce a physical model and you say, look, this suggests that it might be related to... These are trying to establish the, the kind of framework which you would then try to plug into physics. How it fits into physics, you'd have to, a lot of work. But you want a model that has at least some uh, plausibility from the point of view of physics. And so we start with these prototypes, and, and I say this fits in very well with, the, uh, in particular, the notion of mass is very important, as I pointed out to you. The, originally, we start off with the conformal structures, and uh, we want to get to the, uh, a realistic mass parameters. And mass will be one of the things that's going to vary, in some sense, the parameter. And physicists do that a lot. They call it renormalization of mass. They, they, they have mass. And uh, <coughs> so the, that that's what will come into it. By the way, I, I mentioned the Yamami problem as a way of finding the distinguished mass, the distinguished curvature, so metric, scaled. Um, but there is another process, as I mentioned before. In the penrose twister program, uh, you can, with a conformal structure, you can write down the twister space. But if you want to find a metric, an Einstein metric in that class, there is a procedure which Penrose worked out, what you have to look for within the complex variable theory. And if you do that, you get your metric. Now, that is not a constructive process. The, you, you say, if there is, you find a solution, if you find it, that's it. Uh, the Yamami problem says, you solve the differential equation, and if you can do it, you get to the solution. It's a limiting process. But in principle, both are, the, are ways of getting to the metric you want, by natural methods within the context either of the differential geometry or in the context of the holomorphic theory. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there because I'll keep these two parameters up my sleeve as the sort of mm -hmm. you know, exciting thing for next time. Okay, thank you. Yeah? Yes. Do you mean that the proton can be thought of as a connection or some No, the connection, the proton I think of as the manifold. Let me, let me try and, um, I mean, this is, this is, 
important to think. So let me uh, let me see if I can find a. And I need a piece of paper on which to transparency in which to write. Let's see. Oh, here we are. Here we are. A big goal. Let's keep you busy all night. <laughs> this is a very simplified model, okay, of the answer to your question. Here is flat space, empty space, the universe. So no, no time, just... But it's four-dimensional, okay? This is four-dimensional. And very far away, it looks like it has a little circle in its direction, which is the Calusa Klein, and here we have three dimensions. So this is really... The, this is the four-dimensional manifold background. Now, I play the part of God. I put in a proton. What do I do? I cut a little hole. I put in my four-manifold. So the four-manifold is a bubble. This is, this is a manifold with curvature. It's, now, the re real the model proton my prototype model, has an infinite long cylinder, so to speak. Well, that's an idealization. In the real world, that cylinder would have to be taken some finite length and glued into the background. That will be done by some, using some energy, some constraint. God did it. But I mean, somewhere, that you, any model has to be adapted to the real world by some approximation, some process. I don't know exactly what it should be, but the idea is that you, the, the manifold, well, you will fix this model into as a little bubble up here. And there's a lot more manifold you can fit it on over here. And you can, you can, if you want to have a few, you can maybe attach another one to here, this one. Because you can glue these things together. So, the, the, the world of matter has all these bubbles in it, which you don't really, see. if you're in three-dimensional space, you see, you don't see this fourth dimension. We, the the four-dimensional manifold is the model. We live in a, well, we think we live in a three-dimensional world, we don't see the extra dimension. It's anyway too small. The scale is too small. But down here, in this three-dimensional space, we see the boundary, the asymptotic boundary of the Hopf bundle, we see a two-sphere. Inside that two-sphere, we think there is the proton. But it's not quite right. Inside the two-sphere, there is really a four-manifold. We're ending up with a three-sphere with fibers over the two-sphere. And this four-manifold is really the inside of the proton. But we can't see inside the proton. All we can do is send light signals, reflect boundary, get experiments, so physicists live out here. This is the lab. Okay? They shoot electromagnetic waves in here. They reflect back. They look at spectral analysis. Uh, and they, they say, ah, this, the proton has this structure, it has this shape, or any other baryon. The real chap, the baryon, is a manifold. He has a metric. And his metric tells you what kind of signals he sends out. If you send light, shine light on it, it will reflect light in some way, because depending on the curvature of the, of the object... So the geometry of this determines the um, linear information the experimentalist gets. Experimentalists always measure with apparatus. The apparatus basically uses the electromagnetic spectrum. Nothing else. Well, how can you measure anything? Basically, they're all signals, electric signals. And they're basically linear equations you scatter off with the background, scattering theory, if you like. And, you get in, and that information is all experimental physics is about. But it's not the, Now, Einstein objected that was not the real world. The real world was what was behind the experiment. What was it that was producing the information that you saw? Here is, here is experimentalists. Here is where Niels Bohr lived. This is where Einstein Bohr lived. Einstein Light wanted to live, to live up here. He wanted to know what was the real world behind the experiments. Bohr said, you can't ask that question. Not allowed. We are experimentalists. We send in signals. We get back signals. That's the data. That's it. That's what quantum mechanics is about. Einstein said, no, 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 I don't believe you. There's, there's something behind. And I'm trying an Einsteinian. So I'm, my picture is meant to be trying to, some way, hopefully, in some way, see if we can recapture Einstein's vision that matter. You see, in Einstein's equations, he said in time, the Einstein equations had two sides. The left-hand side, which has the Ricci tensor, uh, uh, was zero in empty space. Um, and the right-hand side, it was matter. It was due to the matter and produced what's called the stress energy tensor. And Einstein said, the left-hand side of the equation is beautiful, the right-hand side of the equation is a mess. And he didn't like this mess, the, the data given by you know, the matter. He said, well, he, so uh, he wanted to make matter geometrical so the equation would be beautiful both sides. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to do. I'm taking my matter geometrical, and the idea is a manifold is the particle. And Einstein said, what is a proton? 
I say, look, here is a four-dimensional manifold. Looks beautiful, all the equations. That is your proton. And I said, ah, at last. So um, <laughs> this is a dream, okay? Um, and it, 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 it could be all nonsense. The physicists may just not like it. Uh, I may fail, but at least I will have failed, failed. You know, I will have died on the battlefield. I will have tried hard. <laughs> uh, I, so I think it's, it's, it's less, at least worth, worth trying. Just because people have failed for 100 years doesn't mean you can't succeed eventually. But uh, the picture is very appealing, you see, and this, this kind of picture. I, I think, and it, it, of course, I haven't at all attempted to answer the question about quantum mechanics. You know, if you're trying to sort of give another picture of physics, everybody says, well, what about quantum mechanics? Well, sometimes people start immediately trying to understand quantum I think it's a mistake. You should start further back and only get to quantum mechanics when you need to. And you gradually you see how much physics you try to describe in, in geometrical form. And eventually, perhaps the quantum mechanical stuff will emerge. We'll see what it is the quantum mechanics is. What is it telling us about it? Certainly, quantum mechanics is all involved in this spectral analysis. That's what you see. You know. And the one small indication of some hope is that is hidden in this picture. You see, the, the, for example, one of the key things about quantum mechanics is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. I said, you can't tell exactly where something is and so on. Well, here I haven't got dy dynamics here anyway, but you see, the, the, in, inside the proton, which is what, you, when you think of a proton as a two-sphere, inside it you think there's a three-dimensional ball. And you want to know, p give positions to the points in there. Where is the inside of the proton? Now I say you can't do that, because the inside of the proton is not a ball, it's a four-dimensional manifold. You can't see into this four-dimensional manifold. Of course, you could try to project the four-dimensional manifold back into three-dimensional space, but there's no natural way to do it. And so you might say the uncertainty comes from different ways of doing the projection, and it, you know it's, there's really, really is no no really position is not all defined inside the inside the nucleus. I would say inside the nucleus there is no such thing as position coordinate does not exist. So that would so already begin to undermine one of the you know, problems of arising from quantum mechanics. We have a different different picture which is not permitted to talk about the position inside of the proton. So I think there are ways in which you. Uh, Hopefully, eventually, if this theory goes along, then you'll be able to come to terms with quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is very, of course, people tell me when I try to do these things, you can't touch quantum mechanics. You know, it's so successful. And, and, and Einstein said the same thing. I mean, he knew it was successful. He knew that it gave magnificent results. But nevertheless, he wanted to know what was behind it. And there's no contradiction between saying quantum mechanics is a very powerful way of interpreting the data, getting the results. And it's all correct, it's fine. But you want to know what is behind it, what is, what is in real physics, the real world, that generates the information that goes to quantum mechanics and, and to, to observation. They're perfectly consistent to have two points of view. So there's no need to throw quantum mechanics out. Uh, it's still there. But what you're trying to get is an explanation, a philosophical, geometrical, mathematical explanation, which is uh, you know, reasonably convincing and uh, experimentally testable. Now, this is the first step on a long road. There'll be hundreds of physicists who will out with the machine guns and will uh, uh, out, shoot me down uh, because th this is this is this is really radical. Uh, and uh, you know, anyway, this is the first attempt. I'm going to improve the model later on. I, I got to improve the model further because so far I've told you nothing about dynamics. The, these are static objects. I've indicated what you might call kinematics, namely how things could change and interact and fusion, I talked about the possibilities of, but I haven't told you actually what are the dynamical laws, how it evolves, uh, those are what first of all require a metric and secondly they'll be you know, really complicated and I, 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 don't, I haven't got there yet and also relativistic invariance what, what is, will I have relativistic invariance in this theory? Well I, I hope so, but if not I may have some version of it, so that, that's good, so the next stage, I may get to it, I have ideas on this, will be to incorporate dynamics, motion and then you have to build up. And of course, it would be nice to relate all this to string theory. And you know, I don't think string theory is all nonsense. It's, it, it involves quantum theory more. It's beautiful theory. And a lot of the ideas in here have come from string theory indirectly. So this is, hopefully, will integrate into the string theory. It will be a sort of path. And maybe the string theory will say, ah, oh, we knew this all along. You just, all you're doing is using fancy language. We have a better language for it. So you know, they, may, they may take me over and say, you know, we, we, we can do it better. <laughs> well, all right, I'll I, I wait and see, but th that's, um, anyway, sorry, I hope that was a long answer to your question, but it was a good question, and 
I had to draw this picture. <laughs> There's a physics system. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so physics is there are always some uh, something we find very mysterious. For example, there are so many electric monopoles, but at least in this vicinity of the universe, we can't find any magnetic monopole. Can the geometrical theory shed some light on, on why this is the case? Well, magnetic monopoles are haven't actually been found anywhere in the universe. They're theoretically possible, and there are you know. Uh, but the, 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 the Maxwell equation, say on its own, oh, yeah, yeah. doesn't say anything why the magnetic monopole doesn't exist. Well, uh, no, I mean uh, that's uh, well. You see, I mean there are in the real world, in real physics, there are many questions <laughs> which we don't know the answer. Well, how much matter, antimatter exists in the universe? Does anybody know? I mean, antimatter exists in the laboratory, you make it. But how much antimatter is there in the universe? Are there anti galaxies? I, I don't know the observational evidence is. And, and if they collide, of course, there will be magnificent explosions. But uh, so I don't think people, physicists, know. The theories that they have allow for various possibilities. But whether they exist or not, I don't think they know. And sometimes they, of course, uh, appeal to this anthropic principle and things like that. There are possibilities, but only some of them, only the, only the ones we allow us to live exist. You know, it's a kind of metaphysical point of view. So I think the, uh, I mean, the question of which, what actually exists out in the universe is a big question. Observation, cosmology has to work it out. I'm not trying to solve the problem of cosmology. I'm just trying to produce a mathematical model that is, is perhaps a bit more intelligible and starts off with the nuclear, just looking at the nucleus. Very sort of, because as I, I, when I talked to Nick Manton, one of my physicist's friends, about this thing, and he said, well, and the grand unified theory is supposed to incorporate all the forces, weak force, strong force, gravitation. He says, he says, when he gives a class in physics, he says, the strongest force is the, is the strong force that works in the nucleus. So you should start by understanding that. That's the strongest force. That, then the weak force is very weak. Electromagnetism is, 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 okay, you need to combine that with magnetic, with the strong force, but it's much weaker, and gravitational force is, weak, is almost extremely weak. So try to understand the strong force first, because that's the most... Then you go on. And so the nucleus is meant to be trying to understand the strong force geometrically. And then I throw in also the electromagnetic force, because that's also important. First two steps. The other, the other ones would come later. Uh, but uh, uh, which of them is... You know, and there is all this business about symmetry breaking. Things can happen, but they, certain things can happen at different energy scales. Why do they happen? The, the, and as I said, the ordinary conventional physics models are full of bigger holes in them. You know, this dark energy and dark matter which are around. So the, it's not as though standard physics has solved all the problems and <clears throat> I'm just being a nuisance. There are big problems unsolved. And uh, so there's room for some improvement in the theory. But uh, I, I, So that's the best answer I can give. But, uh, we don't know the answer. But the ordinary physicists don't know the answer either. <laughs> that's, that's why we ask. <laughs> yeah. Well, if I could answer that question, I would be well, well, well ahead. In due course, if I live long enough, but I don't think some, some subsequent generations might answer the question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, <clears throat> I haven't touched on quantum mechanics. Now, and I haven't touched <coughs> on dynamics yet. Um, if, I had, if I talked about the zeibig witten equations, I would have started to do a little bit of quantum theory, because zeibig witten equations, equations certainly involve a solution of the Dirac equation. So, if you like, the next improved model of the proton would be not just a manifold, but a manifold together with a solution of the zeibig witten equations on the manifold which will involve, involve a solution to the Dirac equation, which is kind of a first step to a state. Uh, and then after that, you can, of course, you can, of course, think of perhaps the manifold vibrating, like you're sending off more. It will look at its spectrum. The manifold is a remaining manifold. It has a spectrum. You could look at that spectrum. In fact, the mani this manifold I like, my prototype manifold, its spectrum is, the spectrum is quite encouraging. It has some similarities to the spectrum of the hydrogen atom. So, yes, uh, you'd expect... Uh, other states to arise out of vibrations, of, and those would come from the eigenvalues of the Riemannian geometry on the manifold. Um, by the way, I should have said, in some sense, I'm trying to repeat history, going much further back. Lord Kelvin, in the 19th century, put forward a theory, before the, any atomic theory, that atoms were just knots. 
atom or some knotted vortex tube with ether. And, uh, this was, and the, 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 a lot of people weren't worked on knots because they thought this was a good model. You know, the periodic table would look like tables of knots. And uh, Maxwell said, said for a while, this is the best theory put forward for atoms because the idea was different topological types would give rise to different kinds of atoms. Um, the vib- knots could vibrate and produce spectral properties. Uh, and and uh, uh, so it, it, they had the right kind of features to g- get you going as models of matter. Then, of course, quantum mechanics came along not theory was thrown back to the mathematicians and forgotten uh, for a long time, came back again with the physicists later on. But in some ways, I'm trying to repeat that, but two things different. First, I'm going from three dimensions to four. Secondly, we've learned in the last hundred years a vast amount about geometry in four dimensions, which we can use, which Kelvin couldn't use. Mm-hmm. Even topology was just barely beginning. So, but nevertheless, the idea that the topology provides stability for matter and for numbers, is still here. The, my models are, if you like, four-dimensional Riemannian manifolds instead of not theory. But the, the idea is roughly speaking the same. And he didn't know that at the time. But you, know, you can cut the knot and stick it together. Fusion didn't exist in his day, but subsequently people do it. Mm-hmm. Now we know that. So, you, so I think in spirit, this is a sort of a, a second go at Kelvin's idea in a modern framework. One more dimension, much more geometry, a lot more, of course, a lot of physics has moved on. Quantum theory has developed all the time since, and it threw out all these topological ideas. Now the topology is coming back, incidentally, fire knot theory, to some extent. And we know that three dimensions and four dimensions are quite closely linked. So, it's something that this is trying to revive Kelvin's philosophy, if not his details, I mean, his, his spirit. So, I, I think that's right, it's quite a correct interpretation. But vibrations, yes, certainly, they should be, they should, higher states would correspond to uh, some. Dynamics, the thing would be vibrating. Why not? Uh, manifolds, we, we know all about the spectrum of manifolds. A you know, lot of studies got into it, again, in the last hundred years. Okay, uh, let's uh, thank uh, Michael. Thank you.